Hi there. Welcome to the live drawing party. I'm Danny Gregory and today's Tuesday, May 19th. And we're going to do some drawing. We're going to be drawing glass. So if you've got a glass, a bowl, a bottle, a receptacle of some kind that is made of compressed melted sand, you're in good shape. You might also need a pen, you might also need some paper, a sketchbook, whatever. We're just going to figure it out. We're going to try and think about how do you draw something that is ostensibly invisible, transparent, non-existent. So while you're searching around, I just wanted to say hello to some of my pals. Thistle, Jen, Lenora, welcome back, John, Steve, and so many other people who are now friends of mine, Grace, of course, Myrna, Lori, Hitomi Murakami from Berkeley, California, and Maria from Moscow. I wonder how things are over there in Moscow. Probably quite different than they are here in Phoenix, where it is supposed to not quite reach 100 like it did yesterday, but hot. Nancy in Cleveland, hello. Debbie in St. Charles. So I'm so glad to see all of you here, and I hope that you're interested in doing some drawing. Um, I'm going old school today. I'm going to be drawing on a pen, on a piece of paper with my pen. So that will be exciting, at least for me. You know, I've been drawing on the iPad for quite a while now, and, uh, you know, it's still, it's just so nice to have, because I kind of just leave it lying around, and then when I feel like drawing, I pick it up, pull out the Apple Pencil and just start drawing and painting. But other times, 
you know, you feel like taking another moment to go and get your art supplies together, to feel that tactile feedback that comes from scritchy, scratchy stuff going on paper. It's so nice. It's what attracted me to drawing in the first place. Honestly, what if I hadn't started drawing in this day and age? What if I had said, you know what? The idea of drawing on a piece of glass seems awful and hadn't occurred to me to get a pen and paper. But no. None of those things happened. I'm not sure why I'm even talking about them. It's a parallel universe that uh, at least I don't, I don't live in. Maybe you are. Maybe you're in a parallel universe. But um, This past weekend, we enjoyed Saturday afternoon with Own Marwin. Came to us from England to teach us about drawing with, essentially drawing with watercolor. I was going to say drawing. I didn't mean to say drawing, but I did. That is what she sort of taught us how to do, to draw with watercolor and then with ink. Not a traditional way of doing watercolors, but still really enticing. And I love doing it. I hope you did too. It was um, it was just exciting to see an artist whose work you admire explain how they do it and take us through it live while you know while we're all together. That was so nice too. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of people from all around the world kind of gathered together to to draw together and to learn together and to to ask questions. We had a really lively Q&A session that uh, unfortunately we had, we had to, a minor hiccup, but everybody was very patient and it was so nice. Now, I want to talk about our next workshop just because it's actually kind of relevant to today's project. It's not about drawing glass, but it is about working with cross-hatched lines, hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, all the various elements that go into creating tone when you're just working with ink on paper. You know, you don't have grays. How do you create them? How do you create um, curves? How do you create m modulation and variation? How do you make um, something that goes from dark to light in an elegant way? It's something that the masters figured out. I mean, the world of cross-hatched lines really began, I don't know, certainly Michelangelo was certainly a master of it. Da Vinci did it. You know, it began many hundreds of years ago. And in a lot of ways, it was really perfected during the 19th century, early 20th century, when it was used for reproduction. Because, of course, when you're working just with black ink on paper in a printing press, you know, um, perfecting the ability to to draw with ink lines was was a huge industry, and uh, the work that if you go and look at nineteenth century illustrators, you will see it at its peak. It's really amazing. So, um, but it is it is on some levels intuitive drawing parallel lines. And we've done that our whole lives, doodling. But there's a real science to it. There's a real way of making it uh, comprehensible. And this, it isn't, I mean, this is about drawing, but it's a bit different, I think. Because it's not necessarily about the, the, the focus, at least of this workshop, it's not going to be about necessarily ha how to draw a face. But it's really going to be how to make a face three-dimensional. How to make it look almost photographic. And that's what France does. And so... Once you learn and really understand how cross-hatching works, you'll also really understand how light works. And that's a really important thing for us as, as artists is we want to know, you know, how... Because light is what makes things look three-dimensional. Light is what makes things appear, period, right? We wouldn't see without light. So understanding that skill is a really, really important one. Another thing that you'll also learn in this workshop, and it's, it struck me because I've drawn with France over, I don't know, probably 10 years, maybe longer, that I've known France and been drawing with her. And I have other friends like this too, who really dig deep. They really, I mean, you look at their drawings and you go, oh my God, how did you do that? And then you watch them and you realize, okay, here's how they did it. They worked on it for a long time. They worked on the drawing. They worked on the skills that got them to do this drawing. 
but they also work on the actual drawing. Now, you've seen me draw, you've seen me draw here. I'm pretty fast, right? I'm a sprinter. Every so often, though, I will knuckle down and really get into drawing a single thing at length, in depth. At length and depth, in depth, at width and height as well. Height, that's a new word that I'm not comfortable with, height. So I will use all parts of the compass and get deep into a drawing. It's, it's a great experience. I mean, you end up with, if you know what you're doing and if you're if you have certain skills, you, you'll end up with a drawing that looks really, really great. If you are still learning, you could end up with a drawing that looks really overworked, muddy, de you know, dense and tangled. But there's a skill, and a skill that you can learn about how to lay your lines down in a, in a conscious way, a way that makes sense, there's logic to it. Okay, so it is a it is a technical skill on that level, um, but it's also, as I say, a really deep kind of meditative experience. Something you know, I've quoted him many times before, but my mentor Robert Crumb always says that drawing is really just an excuse for cross hatching. You know that there's something about drawing and laying down those lines, laying them down, laying them down, coming back, coming back over and again, over and again, putting a little bit more on and on and on. That is freeing. It takes your mind somewhere else. And then when you come back from wherever it is that your mind went, you look at your drawing and you go, whoa, that, that's actually really great. So, all right. Thistle, you say you don't have the patience for it? I'm by nature not a patient person either. My mind runs a thousand miles an hour. But that's why doing things like yoga, doing things like meditation, which I never thought I could possibly do, and certainly doing drawing, has calmed and focused my mind. It's made, given me so much pers more perspective and just kind of, I'm just, be I'm just a calmer person because of it. So don't classify yourself as impatient. Don't classify yourself as a person who couldn't possibly do this. Right? That's the one lesson that I hope I've taught you over all the stuff that I'm making and doing is don't box yourself into anything. Don't define yourself in a limiting way, but try and be open to what could be and see if you can explore it. Let's have a look at the kind of preview here of France explaining what her workshop is going to be about. I am France Vanstone and I cannot wait to see you in my workshop. I am going to teach you how to make realistic cross-hatched portraits. In just a couple of hours, you will make a drawing using the same techniques as the master draftsmen like Michelangelo. You will learn how to build up layers of cross-hatched lines so that you can draw anyone realistically. I will show you how to build dimension and volume so that your portraits look even more three-dimensional. We will capture skin, hair, and eyes that look alive. I cannot wait to show you all I know about how to make a good portrait. So see you in the workshop. Pretty cool, right? So that's coming up June 6th. You can, um, you know, you can sign up right now. I would because eventually we close it before June 6th, so you can't get in after that point. But um, France and I have had a lot of conversations about the plan for this workshop, and it's going to be very intense and um, really great. And I think it's the kind of thing that you could just frankly sit and watch her do it, but also you can work along with her or you can re-watch it of course if you sign up for this you'll have access to the recording and we will we will also be doing um, a Q&A with her afterwards and we're also doing something unique that I wanted to tell you about because I think it's something that people have wanted but I haven't really known quite how to deliver it before which is feedback All right people have always said that to me since we began sketchbook school I wish that it could be like a regular workshop a regular class where you came and critiqued critiqued my work and gave me very specific feedback on what exactly I'm doing wrong because it's horrible what I'm making. 
And my attitude has been, you know what? I don't really want to sit around telling you how horrible you are, but fine, if you insist, you suck, and here's why. That's not at all what's going to happen. Forget, scratch that last part. Um, but I, I can understand that, that you'd like to have some feedback. And, and also, I mean, there's something kind of um, imposing about watching somebody who's really, really good at something do it, and then you go, well, I wish that I could see like somebody who was more mortal do it and what they how they accomplish it. So that's the idea. We're going to add on this special thing onto this workshop where you can email in the drawing that you've done in the, I don't know, the rest of the day. You'll have the rest of that day of the workshop to work on your drawing. You email it in. We're going to take a bunch of the, of the different, and, and also you email it in with the thing that you would like feedback on. So if you go, I, I didn't seem to get the eyes right, or I don't really understand this particular part of it, or why does this not seem really th as three-dimensional as yours did, or you know, something else, or some other questions regarding the specifics of what you made. And then we're going to take a bunch of these drawings and a bunch of these questions, and we're going to have a feedback session where France is going to talk about the specifics, and, and here's what this person did, and here's what that person did, and maybe you should do this, and this is good over here, but this could use a bit of work. Whatever, how would, I have no idea what she's going to do. She's an incredible teacher, though, so I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. So we're going to try that out. We'll see. If people sign up for it, we'll keep doing it. If nobody's interested, we'll drop it. But I think it could be a cool thing that people are looking for. So if you're interested, you can sign up for this workshop there. Okay. So today, we are going to focus on drawing some art. Um, yes, so <sighs> Giselle immediately, Giselle's monkey has shown up to say it's overwhelming. How on earth am I going to do even 1% of her cross hatching? We'll find out on June 6th how you're going to do it. Let's not assume that we know what she's going to teach or how she's going to teach us. Let's find out by being there. Okay, enough of that. Let's have a look at this glass. So I have a glass of water over here. And I think what's interesting to do is to notice... So here's... Let's talk about this for a second. So here's this glass, and if we move it into the sunlight, it changes pretty dramatically, right? The shapes. So what I'm doing is I'm not looking about, I'm not talking about the shape of this glass. Clearly, that's a relatively simple thing to draw. It's basically two straight lines and two circles or two ovals. But as we move this, look at how the shapes change, right? So through here, you see the shadow of the table, the shadow that's being cast on the table. And then all these shapes change, right? And the colors change too. So you're seeing the yellow of the table of the wood through here. And then you're seeing these mysterious blue shapes, which I think are actually the ceiling above being cast down. So it's kind of bluish white down here. And then we're seeing all these shapes in here. We're seeing browns, grays. There's so many colors and shapes in here, and that's what we want to explore. We're also seeing textures in here. Let's move this forward. Um, and can you see all these little lines and textures in there? And again, we're seeing this, this shape, the circle. You know what that is? That's the window. And it's not a round window, but of course it appears round because it's reflected in, this, in the shape of this glass. And this glass is dimpled. You see how it has dimpled shapes? And the, as you turn it, these lines are all wiggling and wobbling and, and becoming different shapes. And it's reflecting the window. It's reflecting the entire room here in this glass. So we want to think about where we're going to put it, you know, so that we can you know, have a, have a nice perspective on it. It's also possible that in the course of time as we draw this over the next, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes, the light's going to change. And these shapes are going to change as all the lights and the reflection in the room change. So that's going to be interesting as well. Also, how are we going to do this? Are we going to, you know, are we going to focus on an area and work our way out? Are we going to sketch in the entire glass and then break it up? You know, there are different strategies for what we're going to do. 
And then finally, let's talk about cross-hatching, because I'm going to be using cross-hatching here, because I'm going to be drawing in just black line, okay? So when we're drawing with black line, we have to represent the difference between this mid-tone, this essentially a highlight, right? And then this is even darker, and over here it's actually black. You know, so there's all different kinds of things. So we want to see how we're going to build that up. And you may remember uh, last week we did a drawing of an eye. And we thought about some of these things too. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit about my process as I go. This is not designed, as is often true in the live drawing parties, for me to mansplain my way through exactly how to draw this. This is not a drawing lesson. This is not a drawing workshop. For that, sign up at sketchbookschool.com. But I will tell you about what I'm thinking about in the interest of it being helpful to you, to the extent that, I'm, that I want to. There may come times where I want to just focus on drawing, so I may be quiet during those times, but we'll see. We'll see what we're going to do, okay? So I think, in my case, I think I want to draw it there because I kind of like having, I like having this showing through is super bright. Oh, you see how that changed the camera? Um, yeah, that changes the camera a lot. That's, but I'm not drawing it from the camera. I'm going to be drawing it sitting on my table. So, all right. Are we together now on this? Good. Okay. If you're all ready, let's get, let's get to it. All right. Don't worry, that was not a, a gorilla. Did not come into the room. That was my arm. Okay. So, I have my trusty overhead camera here for the first time in a while. And uh, I'm going to be looking over here as I start to draw. I think what I'm probably going to do is I think I am going to draw the outline of the glass just to orient myself. You know? Now it's tempting to think you know what's going to happen when you do a drawing like this, when you, particularly when you're drawing a glass, because glasses have a lot of surprises built into them. So for instance here, what I'm looking at is I want to draw this lip. But it's actually, as you can see, a series of loops, some of which are very dark, and some of which are white, and some of which go from one to the other. So, you know, I want to make sure that I get all these lines in there. Now I'm looking at this is the line of the edge of the water, the water's edge, as it were. Now, eyeballing, I'm noticing that this distance here is essentially the same as this distance here. I hope one thing that you're going to think about as I'm doing this, I'm not using laws of optics to do this, right? I'm not explaining how light refracts off glass. I don't know. I never paid attention I guess physics class it was terrible. All those classes in high school, but um, what I'm doing is I'm looking, and so that's really the key to this and, to, and basically every kind of drawing that you're going to do is 
to look at relationships and to measure each thing as it comes up. You know, not to go into going, okay, I know the rules of physics that say that this is supposed to be this. No, you're not going to do that because you don't need to. You just don't need to. I'm realizing that the um, shape that I'm making in this glass is slightly different than what you're seeing because I'm seeing it from a slightly different angle than the camera is seeing it from. But you know, so this is going to be the fun part: is when we start to see, we start to break up this landscape into all of its component parts. You know. And we can identify what these things are. Like I can say, okay, this is probably a reflection of the ceiling, and um, you know this. But th it's not really useful. It's more useful to just draw one thing, one shape, and draw another, and just keep going. So what I'm going to do is I'm. Again, there's lots of different approaches that you could use for doing this kind of a drawing, but I am going to just draw outlines of shapes. I'm drawing, doing basically contour drawings of the different shapes that I'm seeing inside this glass and uh, trying to just get them down. And then I'm going to go back in and I'm going to decide how to arrange my tones so that I can get a reasonable range from dark to light and capture all the different areas. And once you start to look into these shapes, they're really fantastic. There's so many weird shapes in here. It's just total abstraction and you know you could you could decide to not even acknowledge that it is a glass and just say, this is an abstraction, an abstract painting, almost, an abstract drawing. As you stare, you start to see shapes within shapes within shapes. It's really interesting that way, too. So other strategies for doing this is you could just pick one area and start to draw it. And then you could draw the area next to it and keep working your way across until you had done the whole thing. Um, it's not how I'm choosing to work today. There have been times that I do do it that way, you know. So okay, so now I'm looking and I'm seeing okay. Oh, there's some other shapes in here I didn't missed, and then there's a line back there. Yeah. So I could also, if I wanted to really focus on drawing the entire scene. So I could say, you know what, I'm going to draw um, the table and I'm going to get into drawing all the wood texture, but I don't have time today. What a life, people. You know, I'm really busy. I've got to go out and do all kinds of things. I don't actually, of course, have to go anywhere, can't go anywhere won't go anywhere. Although, in Phoenix, apparently you can now go everywhere, as I've mentioned before. 
It's a very understanding place to be where you can kind of follow any rules you want. Well, that's not truly true. Okay, so now I'm going to start to lay down some tones. And this is the darkest area, but I'm not making it super dark yet because it's possible that I will find other areas that are as even darker. So I, might, I want to leave myself a little bit of latitude to say, okay, um, I, can, I can make that darker, but I can't make anything lighter. So, um, you can also notice that my lines are parallel. I'm not, I'm not just higgledy-piggledy ske sketching and scrabbling and putting things in like that. I am doing it in as deliberate a way as I am capable of doing, which is um, which is not superhuman. People like France, three years of, of um, doing this, have the motor skills to really make lines sit absolutely next to each other. But I'm reasonably good at it. I mean, I think part of it is also, you know, just slowing down, having a bit of a plan. And then you can also decide that you want to not go up and down like this, but you could also decide to make lines that follow the shape of the thing that you're drawing. So you could make lines that were curved because the glass is curved, you know? That would be certainly um, a strategy that would be quite good. You could do that in certain areas and not in other areas too. There's not a hard, fast rule about it necessarily. Um, but I will do it here. So you see I'm sli slightly arcing these lines. Now, a cool thing about this kind of drawing is you are working from observation, but nobody actually knows whether you're right or not. And that, that can be quite liberating because nobody's ever going to be able to come back and check what you did and go, well, you know what? that area is actually darker than this area. Nobody's ever going to see that because, of course, they won't know your subject. They won't have seen your subject at that very moment that you were drawing it. So you don't have to worry about that inner critic saying to you, uh, you screw that up, that's actually darker. You know? I think that's a problem we, we often have. It's like we, we were worried that we didn't get it right in a way that nobody would ever be able to tell that we got it right or not. You know, and I think, like I've had that experience when you're drawing a building and, and uh, the building has 34 stories and when you draw it, you accidentally put in 26 stories. <laughs> then you go, oh no, I actually didn't make enough windows. There's actually more over here. Of course, nobody would ever know that unless they were like a, a city planner or zoning commissioner. So... Why should you worry about it? If it looks right to you, that's all that matters. And if you screwed it up, just forget that you screwed it up. Don't remind yourself. Don't remind me that I screwed that up. You know? I'm noticing that the light is already starting to change a bit. It is 9.34 here in Phoenix, and of course the sun is, is moving quickly. Now this is the part that I'm really interested in drawing because it's the most interesting, is this reflection of the window. I can see trees, I can see a hedge, but 
earth is so tiny you can't even really tell what they are they're just weird shapes but I love that distorting kind of I did a series of self portraits a couple years ago where I drew myself in various kind of like almost like funhouse mirrors distorting mirrors and um, it was just really cool to take your face and then distort it that way you've probably seen that kind of thing as like a filter on your phone you know you could use that too but it's um i was calling them distortrits because well i'm a former copywriter i can't shake the habit of being pun a pun or punster punishing so now this in here is interesting because it's kind of distorting the wood but also i want to put in a mid-tone here. This is not white. I want to put in a mid-tone. So what I'm going to do is I'm creating this pattern that will give the impression of being a mid-tone, but it's also distorting the wood beneath, which is kind of cool. So there's all this complexity that's happening in here. You know, and you can look at this and you can go like, Jesus, really? Like that just looks like, like, uh, like a fountain pen threw up in your on your drawing. It's not a fountain pen, by the way. It's a Micron Pigma 03. It's a nice pen, not super fine. I like it. But um, yeah, but anyway, you could look at this and go, this is just becoming too super abstracted. But I think what happens is the more work you put into it, the more these things will start to converge and it will become, it'll seem less like a crazy kind of jumble of, of textures and it will become increasingly um, something that looks like a glass reflecting a room, which is what it is. What you also have to do is you have to make decisions about the degree of complexity you want to show in these little abstract patterns. Because you can get carried away with it, and then it starts to lose all meaning, and you get really super fiddly. So that's another thing. So here there is again this midtone, and it's because I'm seeing basically through the bottom of the glass to the table. Again, I'm seeing the wood grain, but it's doing kind of weird things, um, and I like that. So, but also it's somehow because it's closer. You see, this area here, it's, seeing, it's, it's magnifying what I'm seeing below. Whereas this area here is sitting almost on the bottom of the glass, so there's only the glass itself distorting a magnifying. It's not the water. You know, these are, again, things that you start to observe, like, oh, I wonder what all the source of all these crazy shapes is. A, what is it actually reflecting? And B, why is it so nutty? And you start to understand it because you're sort of observing it and trying to decode it and figure out, like, what is that exactly going on here? Okay, so now I'm going to go back in and I'm going to hatch in the opposite direction on certain areas that I want to be darker. And when you do these sort of shorter strokes that don't cover the entire shape, you want to try and match it up so you don't get basically um, a seam, a line where the two are crossing over each other. In this case, I'm going to arc my lines so that they are aping or indicating the curve of the glass, you see. It's definitely gotten darker over the time that I've been drawing this. And so the contrast is more extreme between these various parts. Um, I'm also going to add some gradation to indicate that this is a bit darker here inside 
and so again your pattern doesn't have to just be straight lines it could be squiggly lines that are running in conjunction with each other you know it could be um, other shapes it could be triangles or dots if you wanted to to get crazy you know it could be things that you're seeing that you've decided things that you're seeing in the sh in the various textures of the of your subject that you want to take from being just textures and start making them into shading elements you see so it can become more and more um, of your decision you're not just copying what's there you are creating your own visual language with all these different marks that you're making So it, it, it can go from being just like this mechanical act of like endlessly drawing parallel lines to really a bunch of decisions that you're making and a language that you're creating, a visual language that you're creating to denote different tones, different textures. Because a thing that you also want to think about is like how do you indicate I mean, say this glass was frosted, how would we indicate that? You'd have to come up with a language for doing that. Or if the glass was, um, or, or say you wanted to draw some reflective metal, but you want to indicate that some of it is, you know, kind of matte aluminum, and other of it is very bright stainless steel, uh, you'd have to, you know, there isn't, there isn't like a handbook that you look up these things and go, okay, uh, you know, using parallel dots, is uh, how you indicate this and that. No, it's something that you kind of come up with. Now you might develop shorthand over years of doing this where you go, okay, I know that if I want to make wood, I basically do a bunch of wavy lines in parallel, something like that. Um, but maybe not. Maybe you come up with it on the spot and that's what keeps it fresh and interesting for you, you know? So. Yeah, it's, it's that's, what, that's what makes this whole process so much fun. And, uh, you know, my style of doing this, as you can tell already, is different from France, the France's way of doing it. Um, you know, she's, she's more dedicated to getting a really realistic look to what she's doing. I tend to kind of get carried away f in it, and then suddenly I'm like, oh, I know, I'm just going to, like, basically doodle these these lines because I like that shape, you know? And, uh, yeah, that's just my style is different from hers. My, the things that I want to say are different than the things that she wants to say. And the things that you want to say are different too. You know, we all have our own visual language that we develop unconsciously, I think. A lot of it is not necessarily a decision that you've sat down and said, this is the language that I'm going to use to make art with. No, it's something that just kind of comes out of you and you say, you know, that feels right. I can't exactly say why. A lot of artists are really inarticulate about the art that they make. That's why perhaps they're artists, visual artists rather than, than writers, you know. I am first and foremost a writer, so I like to talk about it. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. You might say, you know what, there's a lot of talking, Gregory, but how about getting on with the actual drawing? Fair enough. Fair enough, that's what you paid for. All right, I kind of like that. I think I'm not going to stop. Okay, what is the cost of a Pigma Micron pen? I don't know, it's about $3. It's not very much money. You buy them in packs. They come in like different sizes and different proportions and dimensions and so forth, so. Yeah. Good enough to drink out of? It was fun to do. I hope you had fun doing it too. Um, 
what else can I let me just look back and see if you have any good questions or not good questions but questions of any kind a lot of people want to know if there's a coupon code there's a coupon we give a discount to the people who sign up for the last one so if you took own Mars you can get a discount on this one if you didn't you can't is this a free course not sure what you mean the one that you're doing right now <gasps> Wencher Sexer from Norway welcome that's so good um, yes so there's a lot of discussion about O3s and O1s um, yes I'm using a Pigma Micron O3 so the O3 is a I like it, um, but I use 05 sometimes. I use I use the full gamut, the full range of um, pen widths. It really kind of depends on how I feel. But right now I feel like an 03. You know, sometimes I want to get like really micro and tiny and do little tiny drawings and get really fiddly, and so I might go you know 01 or even 005. But um, 03 is like you know, it's the uh, I don't know, what would you call it? It's like the, it's the, it's the middle of the road, you know? It's the Toyota Celica of pen widths. Um, anyway, what else do we have among the discussions here? Um, you know, weirdly, a thing that I've been getting into is jigsaw puzzles. We have a jigsaw puzzle set up in the kitchen and just kind of wander in and do it periodically. And there's something about jigsaw puzzles that kind of reminds me of cross hatching. You know, it's just sort of like your brain goes to this place. It's like doing a crosser puzzle. It's not really, it's not really um, a challenge, you know? And when you're done, it's like, whatever, break it up, put it back in the box. Wilma is a chicken. I like chicken, had chicken for dinner last night. Not with a pencil, though. I would begin with a pencil. Um, yes. Okay. Well, uh, um, here's why, I mean, you can do it with a pencil. You can sketch out your whole thing in a pencil. Why not? And then you could erase it or not erase it. You could do the whole th cross hatching in a pencil. In fact, um, France, who draws with pen a lot of the time, also draws with a pencil. She also draws in Procreate on the iPad. But in this class, she's going to be actually working with pencils, which is interesting. She races a little bit. If the reason that you're using a pencil is because, as you say, you are chicken and you're afraid, and that's why you are um, hesitant to commit, so you kind of sketch it out and then you go in. I mean, it's just a different experience. You can do that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, all right, what else? Uh, was there a live party with France from Danny? I don't remember that one. Yes, there was. We, France, um, France drew with me a, a while ago. If you go and look through our videos, you'll find them. Uh, I've drawn France in lots of places. It's a little intimidating, but uh, she also draws um, in People Drawing People, our, our great class about drawing people and she draws all different ways which is really fascinating to see to see her draw from live model too um, Lenore I'm having trouble doing puzzles because we do them on vacation and quarantine is not vacation I guess not but why can't every day be a vacation come on so all right um, all right, sorry, this is art with Ina. I signed up last night before I did rewatch your drawing party with her. It really convinced me. Oh, good. Then do that. Yeah, you should all watch that. She's, I don't know what you need to be convinced of, honestly. You're going to spend a couple of hours on a Saturday. You're going to learn something amazing. If you like what I just did, imagine I am, you know, um, I am a busker. I am a man whistling in the shower, and France is you know, center stage at Carnegie Hall. She's a thousand times better than I am at doing this and at explaining it. So I don't know what you really need to endlessly think about. Just jump in and do it. You know, it's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be, um, you're not gonna be 
disappointed. And if you are, we'll give you your money back. Okay? If you like, if you say that was a complete and utter waste of my time, you can't re recompense me for the time that you wasted of mine, but at least give me my damn money back, Gregory. Done. Ten minutes later, we will refund you. All right? But I'll be hurt, wounded, and curious. Do you think, Jen asks, do you think drawing with cross-hatching requires more pre-planning, -pre mapping out the light and dark areas before you do? Probably. As you can see, I don't do a huge amount of that. I generally, what I generally do is, if you think about the spectrum from black to white, when you look at something initially, it's fairly easy to see if you break it down into basically two tones, right? So if you look at my face right now, uh, I'm dark on one side and light on the other side, right? Dark, light. But then there's a lot of gradations in between. If you wanted to get me rounded, you would do that. So what I do is I tend to look at like, what are the darkest areas, where are the lightest areas? Just kind of have a register of that in my mind. And as you could see, what, what I just did, I kind of put down the dark areas and then leave out the light areas and then start to work my way toward the middle. And then I go back out again and make the darker areas darker. So it's kind of a back and forth. It's sort of like what you might do with watercolor, where you might go in and add a little bit more to your, you know, to your um, washes. So I think you can, I think you could really plan it out and you could do almost like a paint by numbers sort of breakdown of a thing where you said, okay, I'm going to break it down into all the different shapes. It feels a little less fun to me, a little bit more mechanical. I think, I feel like I start to sense the gradations as I'm looking at it more and more. And I'm starting to balance things and say, okay, this is this part over here compared to this part down there. And, and you're starting to do these kind of, um, these comparisons across the whole object and I feel like that's somehow easier for me to do and more fun like I'm making something while I'm doing it as opposed to mapping it all out but that's just that's my approach to making art you know and I think you'll see with France she's very methodical in a way but not but she's also on, constantly making discoveries and rebalancing things I've seen her do that many times where she'll suddenly go back into something that looks like it was finished and then she'll start working on it again and then suddenly it goes from being hey that looks pretty good to whoa that's popped in a, th a three-dimensional way I had never even imagined. But that's all about this balancing and then making your shadows darker, contrast coming in and out, all these different things that happen. Or looking at something that looks like a highlight, but then realizing there's actually a center to the highlight and the area around it is slightly, slightly less light, slightly less white. So what are you going to do now? How are you going to balance that out? That's the fun thing to me, is this back and forth adjusting. It's kind of like, you know, sanding a little bit here and, you know, you can't, again, another reason why I'm not particularly interested in doing it in pencil is because I like having to f fight your way through those problems as opposed to having them place them all out. I don't know, it's a long-winded answer to hopefully what was your question. Um, any can't, wants to join the workshop, but can't be there on that day. Well, um, that's a shame. I would, if I were you, I would just cancel whatever it is you're doing. But even if you don't, the good thing about this workshop is you'll get a recording that you have lifetime access to. So if for some reason you can't be there on time, you can still do it. And we ha we've had people in Australia all weekend long. We were helping people in Australia who had, weren't able to get up at three in the morning to work with Onmar. And then we said, okay, well, you know, you, you can still watch it. We made adjustments. If it's something that's really important to you, figure it out. Make time for it. Um, Chris says, oddly, cross-hatching is one area where copying someone's drawing for the practice doesn't really work. It's something about your hand. Exactly. It's your handwriting, right? It's really not that different from that. How you write your name, how your hand, your lettering, it's very personal. So. I've, I've done that where I was, I went through a period where I was really interested in Van Gogh's drawings that he did with a reed pen. And so I would literally go through and copy every pen stroke that he had done in a drawing. And it sort of looked like him, but the reason it didn't look like him was because even the amount of pressure that he would put on a line, when you use a reed pen, if you push hard, it's darker, and you pull back, it's lighter. I, I don't do, I didn't do it exactly the same way that he did. I'm, I'm not Van Gogh, I'm not Maybe I was my balance was thrown off by having two ears. I don't know, but somehow it wasn't quite like him. So I think you do have to find your way to it. 
if you step back, it might look like a perfect copy, but when you get closer, that's the thing that's that's the thing that's distinctive about it is, you know, and the, and when you're doing cross hatching, when you're drawing thousands of lines, it's really difficult to be a quote unquote forger, I suppose. Um, right. So, is it a workshop on values? It's a workshop on drawing portraits. Values are part of it. A workshop on values? You mean, no. Values are part of it. Values are part of, of figuring that tone, yeah. It's not a workshop on values specifically, though. Um, but, you know, I think... I think... Um, all right. Yes, I think Mimaism makes a good point. Francis' work is realistic, but it looks hand done. It's true. So you wouldn't look at Francis' work and mistake it for a photograph. It's clearly a drawing. And it's not a drawing that was done with one of those dang fangled Photoshop filters that turn drawings, turn photos into drawings. No, you can tell. There are decisions that were being made. There's a brain behind it. There's a personality behind it. There's an artist behind it. And that's where you want to get. So, of course, the first time you do it, it's going to be a struggle because you're thinking and thinking and thinking and working your way through it. But over time, it becomes second nature. It becomes an extension of who you are. Just like when you were five years old and you learned to write your name, it was really hard. And now, if you write your name at all with a pen anymore, uh, it's effortless. So that is the that is the the great thing that happens in the process. Okay. How can you send me my, your picture? Um, well, anyway, anything that you do today, if you'd like to, you can put it on hashtag SBS Drawing Party. And um, I'll check it out. Use that hashtag, put it on social media, and um, we'll track it down. So, Should you come prepared with a photograph of someone? Well, what I, here's what I would do. Sign up for the workshop. We will send you all kinds of information. We'll send you supply lists. We'll send you examples, we'll send you outlines, we'll send you everything you possibly need. France will be working from a photograph of a person and she will be sharing that photograph with you so you could work from that same photograph. If you want to exactly follow along with her and the decisions that she's making, you can work from that exact picture. If you want to bring your own picture, do it differently, by all means. I think the, the good thing about working from the same photograph that she's working from is you know, there, there are good kinds of photographs to work from. Like, you want certain kinds of lighting, you want certain kinds of modeling, you know, to, to learn from. You know, is isn't to say you couldn't draw from any kind of photograph. So, up to you. You can um, work from whatever you want. You can also not do the exact exercise that she's doing. You can simply sit and watch her, or you can go off on your own adventure, um, learning, using the things that she is going to teach you. Okay, so thank you. We spent almost an hour doing this. Well, I spent an hour jabbering at you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to see you on Thursday. We're going to do something else, something fun. If you have any ideas of what you'd like me to do, please um, send them to me. And in the meantime, I hope that you have signed up for Danny's List. That is my weekly essay that I send out on stuff that I'm thinking about. And uh, it's an opportunity for me to share um, some thoughts with you. It doesn't cost anything. You just need to go there, add your name to the list, and I'll send it to you on Friday, which is generally when I do it. If, so if I haven't missed a Friday, but you never know. So anyways, do that, and uh, I'd like to kind of chat with you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for staying with me. I will see you on Thursday. Bye-bye. Have a good day.